je m'appelle Mélanie. Mm. Uh, merci de uh, m'accueillir. Uh, uh, malgré uh, niveau de français, <laughs> mon niveau de français. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about I.O. observability with PGStat.io. So it's a new statistics view that was added to master, to merged into Postgres on Saturday, actually, that I wrote. Um, and <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're going to talk about it. Um, so just about me, I work at Microsoft, and I focus, I've worked on the planner and um, on the executor at the beginning of uh, my time hacking on Postgres, but recently I've focused on IO performance and um, Linux kernel block device tuning and uh, benchmarking and storage performance work. Our team, uh, led by Andres Freund, is focused on direct IO and asynchronous IO as our large project, and then we do smaller projects, obviously, as well. So, so uh, some also the format might be a bit odd because it was in PowerPoint and then <laughs> converted to LibreOffice, so bear with me. Um, so as a user, uh, the things that you care about and how you actually, uh, like the goals that a user will have, the things that they care about are transactions per second and like low latency, right? Those are your main things that you care about for your transactional workload. But often the reasons that you're not able to achieve high throughput, high TPS, transactions per second, and um, low latency is because your working set is not in memory or often, and these are just IO specific reasons that you might have performance issues or auto vacuum is bottlenecked on IO. So when you're thinking about how to tune Postgres to address these performance issues, uh, these three areas are ones that you will often tune in order to try to improve your IO performance. So changing the size of shared buffers, probably increasing it, <laughs> uh, tuning the background writer, and uh, also tuning auto vacuum. I'm gonna primarily focus on the first two um, so let's talk about what IO statistics existed in Postgres already before my view was added. So uh, you have PGStat database, PGStat IO all tables, and PGStat background writer all had some information about IO. And then of course, as other presentations have mentioned, the extension PGStat statements is often used by uh, by users to observe their I.O. performance and think about tuning. So there are some drawbacks and gaps in these existing I.O. Uh, statistics views. So the ones that we were trying to address in PGStat I.O. Uh, included the fact that writes, so most of those views actually don't include much information about writes. You have block write time in PGStat uh, database, but largely writes are not the focus. And when the writes that are included uh, combine flushes of dirty data and extends of a file. Uh, and I'll explain why that matters in a second. Um, also, all backend types. So backend types like uh, client backends, also auto vacuum worker, check pointer, other types of m auxiliary processes, all of their I.O. is combined. So you can't tell what I.O. is uh, being done by which backend type. Uh, and here I also say context, so all I.O. is combined for all contexts. We're going to talk about that in a minute, what I mean by context, but uh, one of the things that I mean is about different types of buffers. So I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so this is what PGSAT.io looks like. You can see a lot of its zeros because uh, this was from a freshly initialized database. But uh, so you have different columns. You have backend type, IO object, which right now we have temporalation and relation, IO context, and here you can see we have bulk read, bulk write, normal and um, vacuum. And then you have a few other columns. So these are the IO operations, reads, 
writes, and extends. And then we also have evictions, reuses, and f-syncs. So these are all the columns. And the goal for pgstat.io is to unify all of the IO statistics that uh, are cluster-wide or would be relevant cluster-wide into a single view. So with this, we're deprecating some of the columns and pgstat background writer, um, as well as uh, some of the, well, we will add wall IO, so some of the columns in pgstat wall will go away. Uh, and there's a few other, some of the columns in pgstat database and a few other columns. Now, you may still want to use pgstat database because it's per database, obviously. Um, and pgstat statements has its own use case because it's per statement. So there's a lot of other IO statistics that you might want to still use, but anything that's going to be like cluster wide will eventually be moved into this view. And one of the nice things about this is that because of the infrastructure that we added in order to uh, provide this view, now uh, other like per session or per database IO statistics can draw from this infrastructure and use it to present per backend or per context statistics. So it actually, outside of just allowing us to create this view, it, the infrastructure that I added will also allow uh, like everything from pgstat statements to other views to have more granular and more accurate statistics. So why do we care about counting flushes and extends separately? Uh, in pgstat.io, we call a flush a write. Um, so it's a little bit overloaded, but the reason is our intent is to include non-block-oriented I.O. also in pgstat.io. So you can imagine, and also other block-oriented I.O. that is not uh, in the same block size as your uh, standard block size. So um, there's other types of uh, I.O. that's done in the database that we want to be able to include that is not block oriented. So we called a we called flushes writes and extend is an extend. So in order to explain why we care about writes versus extends, I'm going to go through some of the Postgres internal uh, sort of processes and talk about the Postgres internals workflow that will inform or motivate why we care about the difference between flushes and extends. So update and insert, pretty similar, but uh, in terms of the I.O. workflow, so we're just going to use insert because it's a bit simpler. Um, so the first thing that you'll do is, or that Postgres will do, is look for a block that has enough free space, right? And uh, if there isn't one, then it needs to extend the file. So this is important because if you're working, if you're, uh, if you're like, data is growing, you will have to extend the file, right, eventually. So no matter what you set fill factor to or any of that, you're going to have to extend the file. The next thing, once it identifies the block that it's going to insert the data into, is it will find, it needs to find a buffer in shared buffers in, to load that data into. So if that block is already in shared buffers, then that's a hit. So no I.O. is needed. Otherwise, it will need to uh, evict uh, a block that's, already, that's in shared buffers and write that, if that block is, or sorry, if that buffer is dirty, it will have to write that data out to the file. So this is important because we're talk, when we talk about a write, it's flushing data that, uh, so that we don't lose it, right? So if we don't write it out, then we would lose it. Um, and this is, for a totally different block in the file. So in order for us to do our insert, we have to flush dirty data from another block. So th this, like, you'll see why that's important in a second. And then we read our, our block into the buffer, and now we can write our data into the buffer. And this is not a write in the, because it's just in the buffer, and then it stays there. We don't do any I.O. with that. OK, so going back to the question that I posed, why count flushes and extends separately? So synchronous flushes are avoidable. If you tune background writer correctly, uh, 
and also check pointer plays a role, and you've sized shared buffers accordingly, ideally your working set fits in memory, and you don't need to flush dirty data in order to read your own data into a buffer. That's the, the goal. Now, extends, on the other hand, are unavoidable you know, at some point. So you, if your data is growing, you will have to extend files. So right now, all of the statistics in Postgres on writes combine extends and actual flushes. So you can't tell if the writes that you're seeing are avoidable or unavoidable. Sorry, a lot of the words are <laughs> messed up a little bit because of the translation from PowerPoint. So earlier I mentioned context and backend type. So why does it matter if we split the I.O. by context and backend type? To motivate that, I'm going to talk about the auto vacuum workflow because it is an example of why we care about splitting I.O. at that level of granularity. So vacuum will identify the blocks that it's auto vacuum worker will identify the blocks it needs to vacuum and get them together. And then when after it's done that, it has like a list of the blocks that it's going to vacuum. And then it will you know, start with the first one and go on from there. And so once it has the next block it needs to vacuum, it will check for the block in shared buffers. If it is, vacuum it, done, no IO needed. Otherwise, it's going to find the next reserve buffer to use. So see, this is different because even though technically these are shared buffers, there's a special uh, internal uh, sort of system in Postgres called buffer access strategies. And it's a system of reserving shared buffers for use by certain kinds of uh, operations. So auto vacuum does not use shared buffers in the typical sense. It will have a ring of reserved buffers and then it's going to read data into them and then reuse them uh, as opposed to taking over all of your shared buffers is the idea behind it. So here, it, it's going to find the next reserve buffer to use and you'll notice that you're going to get uh, when it first adds reserved buffers, it evicts data from shared buffers in order to reserve them. So it's like evict a shared buffer, add it to your reservation list, and now it's part of the auto vacuum ring buffer, basically. When it goes and reuses it, so you saw earlier in the view, we had a column for evictions, a column for reuses, and reuses are basically reserved buffer evictions. So we're differentiating there because it's different. If you only have four reserved buffers, even if they're available non-dirty shared buffers, you're still going to evict the reserved buffer that you had used before and write out the dirty data before you'll use available shared buffers. So then that's a flush, then it will read the block into the buffer, and now it can vacuum the buffer and mark it dirty. So why does that matter? Oh, yeah, at the end it returns the reserve buffers. So why does that matter uh, from the perspective of pgstat.io? So not all IO is for blocks that are part of the working set. And that might sound obvious, but think about auto vacuum. Some of the blocks that it's vacuuming may be older than your working set. It's like doing garbage collection, those might be older blocks. They might not be part of your current working set. So it's useful to separate though that I.O. from the I.O. that's part of your current working set of your transactional workload. This uh, also applies to various bulk operations for analytical workloads, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. So why do we care about context? So context, that column in the view that I mentioned earlier, so one of the contexts is vacuum. So we, uh, we talked about the reservation system. What is important about that is these are essentially not shared buffers. They are not able to be used once they're reserved as 
uh, as normal shared buffers by the rest of your workload. So we're distinguishing that this I.O. was done as part of the vacuum context and used reserved buffers. So I want to talk a little bit about analytic workload uh, I.O. characteristics and how this plays into the way that we've chosen to structure the PG stat I.O. view. So for an analytic workload, if you do, for example, a copy from, you're going to see a lot of extend, op, you know, extends because you're adding new data. Um, and for, say, a large select, you will see a lot of reads um, of data that's not in shared buffers. So going back to our motivating question, why track I.O. per context? So you remember that I mentioned bulk read and bulk write as contexts. And so here, for a large select, which is defined as one where the number of blocks of data in the table is greater than the number of shared buffers divided by four. Sadly, that's on the next line. Um, and so we don't use shared buffers for these type of bulk operations. So it's important to be able to differentiate between the kind of uh, churn that you might see when shared buffers is too small. And for the bottom example is a client backend that is reading data from your normal working set is say, your shared buffers are too small, so you're evicting data so that you can read in new data, and then perhaps even reading in the same block again later, just because your shared buffers are too small. So that's an indicator that you need to increase the size of shared buffers. Whereas if you see a lot of reads that are in the bulk read context, uh, that seems pretty normal. A lot of people have analytic workloads where their bulk reads are of tables that don't fit in shared buffers. So it's nice to be able to separate those from the reads done by client backends reading data that's part of your normal working set. So the same question as before, why count flushes and extends separately? As I mentioned, copy from would do a lot of extends, which is different than needing to do a lot of writes in order to evict dirty data or flush dirty data to disk. So extends are normal. So the idea behind this is being able to distinguish between I.O. from different types of operations for the purpose of tuning. So now let's talk about how you can use the information in pgstat.io to actually uh, be data-driven with your tuning. So let's say that in pgstat.io, you see that client backend normal context reads are high. So because we've separated out all other types of reads, like bulk reads, and uh, vacuum reads, and et cetera. This probably means, if you see this, that shared buffers is too small. The exception is that, obviously, when you initialize your database, you're going to need to read the data in at the beginning. But So this is an indicator that you may need to increase the size of shared buffers. The other thing that, this is kind of running off the page, but uh, is you can tell if background writer is too passive. Often what you'll see is a lot of client backend normal context writes. So this is client backends being forced to flush dirty data synchronously before they're able to read in their own data or, yeah. Where, and so often what you'll see is you may see background writer normal context writes even if the background writer is too passive. So just because you see writes by the background writer doesn't mean that you don't need to make the background writer more aggressive. Any number of client backend normal context writes that you see is suspicious, basically, because we've subtracted out 
all other types of sort of expected rights and extents. Um, so one of the things that we can do here is sort of inform our cash hit ratio. So many of you probably use PGSAT database blocks hit and blocks red when you're calculating your cash hit ratio. And um, that's you'll probably still do that because uh, it's per database and that might be relevant. But now, if you want to look inform your cash hit ratio, you can look at the number of client back in normal context reads because that doesn't include vacuum reads and bulk reads and other types of reads that might not be relevant when you're thinking about whether or not, for example, you need to increase the size of shared buffers. Um, so this is a way of sort of thinking about how can we take away the information that's polluting our good information in order to think about tuning the database. So what haven't we added yet or what's next? The two sort of next steps for PGStat.io are adding timing. Right now there is the number of blocks read or written, but not uh, the amount of time, block read time, block write time. Um, and then the other one is bypass IO is what we're calling it, but basically there are various operations in the database that do not go through shared buffers. So when you make indexes, for example, um, when you do create DB, there's various times in which you are directly using the, um, uh, basically, not exactly, but doing read and write. And so those are not tracked anywhere right now. And so in any of the IO statistics, so we want to uh, add those to pgstat.io. That is my last slide, but I would love to take questions. Okay, uh, you described the IOs about uh, relation uh, buffers. Uh, do you have also some things about uh, wall IOs? Yeah, so that's not in this version of the view. But our plan is to include the s many of the columns in PGSTAT wall to incorporate them into PGSTAT IO so you get a one view of the IO for the database. But not yet, probably for, honestly at this point, probably for 17. <laughs> but <laughs> this is in 16, by the way. Can't have this now. You mentioned the rights uh, induced by extending the relations. Uh, do you have any tips for optimizing that? Optimizing uh, extends? Yes. I mean, the main thing that you can do is change fill factor. So you can decrease the fill factor to minimize the number of extends that you do. Um, I don't know. Was that your question? or if? Um, I guess my exact question is if you notice your database has a problem with uh, to f with extending uh, the relations too frequently. What are resources we have, uh, be it on the Postgres side or the file system side, or any incoming features that will help with that? Well, so if your data set is growing, you will have to extend the file eventually. But decreasing the fill factor parameter means you'll be able to fit more tuples into the existing blocks. Also, if you are, you can, it depends on if it's a, so if it's a transactional workload and part of the reason that there isn't space is because you haven't been vacuuming appropriately, then that's also something that you can do. Um, so the other types of tuning you would do, for example, for auto vacuum could help you with that, but it's an inevitability if your data set is growing. Thank you for your sorry. Uh, thank you um, for the presentation. 
uh, I suppose that the, that the number of uh, writes and reads are counted since the, the opening of the database, right? So is it a way to reset them just to track uh, uh, the activity of a specific transaction or for uh, a nightly uh, batch, for example? So you can reset the stats, like in pgstat.io, that if you do pgstat reset shared, and then IO in parentheses, that will reset all of the statistics. But um, to do it at the granularity of a transaction is, you would have to manage that yourself. Like re when you reset, it would reset it right away, and then, yeah. So. Um, if you want to monitor the I.O. performance of a particular query, then probably pgstat statements is what you would want. Um, but then that's over time, too, so yeah. I'd Thank you, Melanie.